This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and it's Saturday. That means it's time for Nita Notes, my weekly vlog series about limited magic. I think this is actually the 100th Nita Notes, which is kind of crazy because in my head, I still somehow think of this as a new series on the channel, and I guess it is newer than MTG Top 10 and draft videos, but kind of crazy. It's been like two years since I started doing this one. But anyway, we are at this usual phase in the early part of a limited format where we're like, you know, a week into it really being available um, after pre-release and stuff like that. And as usual, when I'm about 10 drafts in, which is where I am at this point, generally speaking, I like to do a five early takeaways video. Obviously, 10 drafts isn't going to be enough for me to come away with like a concrete opinion that I think is 100% correct about anything because it's such a small sample size. And sometimes I'm going to be wrong about things in this particular video, you know, in this series. But I did want to tell you sort of how I'm feeling about the format about 10 drafts in, and maybe that'll help you do better. So the first one, and probably the most obvious and maybe least surprising, but I think it bears repeating, is adventures are really good. Um, you know, if you're going to go into a draft and take every card that has an adventure, you know, your deck could not be amazing, but it would be better than if you took cards that weren't adventures. Because overall, just the fact that they all do two things with one card, some of them have real two-for-one potential, including common ones, like the three mana four two as a combat trick on the other side, like that thing is a beating. All of those cards, you know, that are capable of generating a two-for-one have been great. But even when they're not, even when they're like big giants who can bounce something in the early game and stuff like that, they're just really good. I mean, you you get them early, and usually you can get value out of both sides. And then when you draw them late, you can just cast the whole thing, and that value feels really good too. Um, there are exceptions to this, of course, but I think it's important to note that adventures are really, really good. Just like last time in Eldraine, you know, looking at the rate of each side of a card... Um, isn't a good way to evaluate them because for most of them, especially at common and uncommon, they wouldn't be very good. But it doesn't matter. They're, you know, they give you something to do. It's also important that they give you something to do with your mana, uh, generally speaking, because, you know, that's one of the ways that you can really just end up winning in limited. And it sounds kind of boring, but it's using your mana every turn. Like, surprisingly, that is like a key aspect to winning when you play limited because you're making full use of your resources every turn and adventures really help you do that. So there's just a lot to like about them. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is probably the most obvious thing. Not going to be, I think, a huge um, insight that I have, but it is important enough in the format that I wanted to mention it. The second thing I want to mention is that you need to be assertive. Um, so far in this format, in the drafts I've done, I've had four seven-win decks. Three of them were outright aggressive, and one of them was a blue-red spells deck from the early access event, and you can watch most of these drafts here on the channel uh, already, by the way. But um, that deck, maybe it wasn't fast, you know, because it tried to win the game by grinding out value with uh, the blue-red signpost and common and stuff, but it had lots of early drops. Anytime I've tried to be a little wacky and like draft a blue green ramp deck that doesn't have much in the way of early interaction and stuff like that it hasn't gone very well um so so far i find it hard you know after you know three or so drafts that have just been kind of train wrecks compared to all the other ones um i've found myself not that interested in trying to be a sort of a slow grindy sort of deck and more interested in being um at least assertive and if not outright aggressive. I do kind of hope this ends up not being a true um, thing about this format in the long run, because I like formats when you don't have to be assertive, but you can have a format where you have to be assertive and you can still have slower decks. You just need to make sure you're valuing cheap things that do interact or add to the board early so that you can enjoy your late game. Um, so that's really important in this format. It, it, that is something you have to do in this format. It's not one where you can just sort of hang back and, you know, uh, try to do silly things rather than add to the board early. The third takeaway I want to mention is that fixing's pretty good, especially if you're in green or red. Um, there are, you know, there's enough incidental treasure in red and enough fixing on, like, already pretty good cards in green that those colors, if you're in one of them, it's really not that hard to 
splash a third color and you're not usually going really hard on a splash in this format you can potentially do it in the green decks and i mean i've kind of tried to do it but so far i don't really recommend it for the same reasons i was talking about be assertive like going crazy multicolor and spending time like searching up lands just hasn't gone that well for me so far so uh generally you know splashing a third color i think is very doable um rather organically even in uh both red and blue or green rather and this can be especially useful uh if you have like an adventure you know there's the two colored adventures at uncommon almost all of which are amazing uh to go back to adventures are good um and sometimes you can only cast one half of it like i've had um red aggro decks where i have imidane's recruiter and, you know, my deck doesn't have any real white mana in it, but I have, like, two cards that make treasure, and sometimes I can just cast the other half, and when I can, that's really good. Um, and that ends up being very doable in the format without having to really mess with your mana base. But you do also have access to Evolving Wilds and, to a lesser extent, Crystal Grotto, which I'm not a huge fan of, um, and Prophetic Prism, too. So there's, there's colorless fixing around, too, if you really want it. Um, so, you know, fixing's pretty good. Uh, not so good that you want to spend time like searching up lands, but good in the sense that you're going to end up being able to cast the second half of your off-color adventure creatures more often uh, than you might think. The fourth thing I want to mention is that Bargain is far from automatic. Um, I didn't think it was going to be automatic in the set review, but I would say so far uh, getting Bargain set up is a little harder than I thought, especially in some color pairs. Like, if you end up in blue-green, for example, um, there aren't that many tokens you're going to end up with. You might end up with some food, but blue doesn't have any tokens inherently, and so anytime you're in a blue color pair, um, your chance of bargaining kind of goes down. And, you know, I've ended up in decks, like, it was one that ended up not working out because I was trying to do something too wacky in a format where you need to be assertive early, uh, but I drafted the uh, Thunderous Awakening or whatever, the eight-mana bargain thing that lets you put two creatures from the top 20 onto the battlefield. Um, so, you know, that card is really powerful, but I got to the end of the draft and I was like, wait a second, I don't have very much bargain, you know? And you just don't find yourself um, using it, able to use it as much in the blue color pairs. It can be kind of automatic in some color pairs, admittedly. I mean, you know, black green can use bargain really effectively and so can black white, both of those are set up really well to use bargain. In fact, black, white's like, that's the archetype, right? But it's not automatic in all the color pairs, I guess is a better way of putting it. Um, there are lots of tokens around, but in a color pair like blue, green, you end up not that interested in playing like the roll tokens and you end up not that interested in playing food. Um, and so you just end up not getting that much of it. And so you're not gonna be able to bargain your cards as effectively in a color pair like that one. Um, most decks, you know, can bargain reasonably often, and most of the cards have a good enough baseline that I'm not saying don't play cards with bargain, but don't expect them to be like at their 100% value, um, all the time. And then my last early takeaway is that synergy so far to me doesn't feel that important. Um, of the four decks I've won seven games with, three of them didn't really have synergy. <laughs> they were just uh aggro decks basically that had really good adventures in them um and you know that's kind of what they did they you know the adventures that have combat tricks on them are especially good in all of these combat um these aggressive decks because you know uh you end up getting two for ones with them a lot you force your opponent in a situation where they have to block a lot so you know overall um i haven't been that impressed you know I, i've gone hard on synergy a few times um one of them uh, was during the early access event where I did have a really synergistic blue red deck, but I did a really synergistic blue red deck more recently that just got destroyed by my more aggressive decks. I had like four of the catapult and two of the signpost uncommon that lets you play things off the top of your library. And, you know, it just didn't matter. I was just sort of dirtling around and, and it didn't go very well. I'm not saying synergy doesn't work in the format. You know, the exact thing I said is synergy is not a requirement. That's that's those are the words that I said and I think that's truer in some color pairs like I've been saying since the set review um that blue white for example just isn't going to be a synergy deck most of the time because all the payoffs for tapping stuff are at higher rarities so you know that deck to me looked pretty obvious red green to a lesser extent looked that way but it's been true in other decks too uh, in other color pairs just having like a good curve good removal 
sort of traditional stuff going on and, and lots of good adventures um, has been what's carried me to more wins more often than jamming as much synergy into my deck as I possibly can. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying, again, synergy does work in this format. I've had it work. I've seen it work. But it's definitely not a requirement. There are some formats where it pretty much is, where you can't really do well if you're not hitting the big synergy points, if you don't have a critical mass of synergy in your deck. You're not going to be able to keep up with everyone else. This just isn't one of those formats. So those are my five early takeaways. I also want to do a crack-a-pack because we're here early in the format. So we're going to go ahead and look at a pack one, pick one situation. I'll talk about the cards in the pack and how I feel about them. And then I'll tell you what I would first pick. Our Enchanted Tales card is Utopia Sprawl. This is a pretty good one. Um, you know, the one time I drafted it was really sad for me because in the set review and everything I was talking about, you know, playing turn one Utopia Sprawl in the land, then turn two Troyon, that's the blue-green signpost in common. And then you can on turn three play a six drop. And I had Utopia Sprawl and Troyon in a deck. Never really got to play either of them, which was really disappointing. Um, but, you know, that is crazy upside. Even if you don't have Troyon, Utopia Sprawl is pretty good. You know, it gets you to three mana on turn two. That's always a powerful thing in Limited. It's an enchantment in a format where those matter. It is something I think you can first pick in some weaker packs. It definitely sets you on sort of a path of being rampier, but it's also a nice source of fixing and stuff too. Uh, our first common is Return Triumphant. I haven't been that impressed with this. I did see someone use it to reanimate the 2-3 um, that draws you a card when an aura enters the battlefield. And when you do that, it feels pretty insane because it comes with an aura, and so they get to draw the card. Uh, that's powerful, but that's kind of a wombo combo that I've seen that's pretty sweet. Overall, you know, this kind of card is always a little awkward. Um, you know, having one in your white decks isn't bad ever, but it gets a little awkward because it's a two-drop that you basically never play on turn, turn two, and that's always kind of a liability. So it's not something I love. Certainly don't want to first pick it. After that, we've got Moment of Valor. I haven't been that impressed with this. You know, it's got modality, but it's fairly inefficient at both things that it does you know a combat trick that costs three is just not that great and limited these days and sure it also has this removal mode but not all opponents will have that many targets i mean it's, it's like return triumphant playing one isn't a bad thing but you certainly don't want to first pick it return from the wilds is next um you know this is a ramp spell slash fixing spell that can add to the board because it gives you this one one and that's nice um you know, again, I haven't been that... This isn't one I've been that impressed with in my first 10 drafts in the format overall. I hope it's better than I've been experiencing because it does seem like the kind of spell that would make ramp decks really good in the format, but so far it hasn't really worked for me. Um, I like Utopia Sprawl more because it has this bigger spike in the early game. The nice thing about Return from the Wilds compared to the Sprawl, though, is that it actually does something late, you know, unlike Utopia Sprawl, generally speaking. Uh, Mintstrosity is next. This is a perfectly un perfectly reasonable, unexciting two-drop. You know, replaces itself with food. Food is good fodder for all sorts of stuff, whether you you want food itself or just to bargain. Um, so, you know, it's okay. Still on Utopia Sprawl. Spell Stutters next. This has been pretty good. Um, I don't know that I would take it over Utopia Sprawl, but it's been a pretty good blue common. Uh, even if you're not in fairies, it's kind of a reasonable counter spell in the format. People end up you know, spending all of their mana pretty often, partly because of adventures. And while counter magic is bad against adventures, um, once they're already in exile, because at that point you're only countering half a card, if you counter the front side of an adventure, it just goes away. And so, you know, it's still a one-for-one -one trade, but the potential value your opponent could have gotten from an adventure is pretty high. And so taking that away for two mana can feel pretty good. It's not something you want to first pick, but having them in blue decks is fine. Uh, Ferocious Werefox is next. This is a common I like a lot. Um, it's one of these I was talking about in the first part of the video where I was saying, hey, you know, these um, adventure creatures that have a trick on one side and they're a creature on the other are pretty good. This is one of those. Um, you know, the trick is not efficient. You know, two mana for plus one plus one and trample isn't great. Even with the, the, the plus one plus one and trample sticking around because it's an aura, um... And a 4-mana four 4-3 four, with Trample is nothing special either, right? Well, you get both out of the same card. This is a common that can generate 2-for-1s a decent chunk of the time. 
And then on top of that, it happens to have four power, which some red-green cards care about. The fact that it is a 4-3 Trampler to begin with means it's good with uh, rolls and stuff. Like, it just ends up being a nice brawler in this format for the most part. I think I would take it over Utopia Sprawl. Like, the Sprawl has a higher ceiling for sure, but the Werefox has a much higher floor. And so I think in the end, that's probably where I would go, you know, if we were to stop here. Armory Mice is next. Um, kind of like Minstrosity, it's an okay two drop. That is nothing special. Certainly not something you first pick. Frantic Firebolt is next. I was higher on this card at the beginning of the format than I am now. I still think it's really good, especially in blue-red. Um, but in like a red-white aggro deck or in some red-green decks, um, the, this ends up only doing two a little too often. And when that's the case, it's been it's been a little less impressive than I wanted. You need to be able to have it do three, like by turn four, a decent chunk of the time, or it can be kind of a bad card in your hand. Like you can't kill your opponent's three drop or whatever. And uh, that's all you can do with your turn, but you can't cast your Firebolt because it won't kill the thing. Like that ends up coming up more often than I expected. It's still really good. Um, and it's probably is what I would take in this pack now. I'm just saying... It, it isn't the kind of card you take and it just slots into every red deck. Um, it has a really nice ceiling. Um, it's not quite Gandalf Sanction, but it, it is a nice removal spell overall. And it works in most of the decks, but there are times where you're like, this isn't actually that good when you get to the end of your draft. Wicked Visitor is next. This is our third medium two drop in the pack that you don't really want to first pick. Um, so, you know, we're not going to. Uh, now we move to the Uncommons. Monstrous Rage. So... I don't like that many of the tricks in the format that aren't stapled to creatures. I mean, the reason for you to run those kinds of tricks um, is drastically reduced. You know, tricks have this big problem where they're they're hugely situational, right? Well, if you staple one to a creature, it's not really true anymore um, because now you have, you know, this creature you can play as, in any situation, you know, assuming you have the mana and everything. And then it also has this two for one potential because it's a trick on the other side. So, you know, it's pretty impressive when you can do that. And so there aren't that many tricks. I'm like, yeah, I want to run in this format, but Monstrous Rage is one of them. Um, I had one uh, seven win uh, blue red aggro deck of all things that ran Monstrous Rage. And it was like a complete beating every time I had it. Um, really powerful. Plus three plus one and trample for one red is great and then the plus one plus one and trample part sticks around um it just ends up ending a lot of games winning a lot of combats and it's just so cheap you know that's part of what helps it basically none of the creatures who have uh combat tricks stapled to them as adventures none of them are one mana right this one is <laughs> and so that kind of efficiency when you can get a one for one trade and some serious tempo um is very powerful that said i think i would still take firebolt over it just like Firebolt, Monstrous Rage isn't something you want in every deck. If you're not an aggro deck, it goes, it's probably going to get cut. Um, so the Firebolt is sort of more likely overall, I feel like, to end up in the deck. Although, if I keep feeling the same way about this format as I do right now, Monstrous Rage may move up in my pick order because I've liked aggro so much. Our next uncommon, I think, is one of the best ones in the whole set. Obviously enough, it's going to be our pick now. And that is Gingerbread Hunter. So, you know, one side you have a 5 mana 5-5 five, five that makes a food. That's a card you pretty much always play. It's a nice beefy creature that will help you gain life and stabilize against aggressive decks, which is important in this format. And then the other side is a straight up removal spell. The removal spell isn't that efficient um, on its own. Maybe not a card you would play unless you were a little desperate, but you get both out of this card. This is, you know, a card that gives you a two for one and then some extra value because of the food token, which can be used for bargain or for food synergies in the black green deck. So, you know, the Hunter is amazing. Getting a two-for-one out of it is very easy, very doable, um, and both halves of the card are nice. You know, this is one where, you know, if you're not black-green, um, let's say you're red-green and you're playing Gingerbread Hunter and you have, like, two cards that make treasure, you know, that's fine. Um, you're not always going to be able to cast the other side, but it's still a really good card, and that's part of what makes it an even better first pick because when you take it, your chances of playing this card are higher than most. You know, usually when you look at a multicolored card, you're like, my chances are less, right? Well, that's not true with a lot of these two-color adventure creatures because on one side, you have a playable enough card and then the other you do. So if you're also in a black-red deck, you could be playing this mostly as something you cast for the, for the mediocre removal spell, but then in the mid to late game, maybe you have a treasure around and you can play the hunter. So 
you know, it's not going to be first pick worthy in every deck. Like if, if you're not in straight up black green, it's not going to feel like something you're pumped about first picking. But the fail case of the card is still, well, it's going to make it in more of my decks than any other first pick in this pack is. And it has a really high ceiling. So that's part of what makes it such a good first pick. We also have another one of these uncommon two-colored adventures. This one's not quite as exciting to me. Uh, Callus Cell Sword. It's still a pretty nice card, um, but you know the the adventure side is highly situational comparatively. Um, you know, it lets makes one of your creatures do damage equal to its power to something, and then you sack the creature. And then the other side is a creature that can sometimes be a little bit bigger, but it's pretty hard to actually get it into play with a bunch of counters. It happens sometimes, but most of the time it's like a two mana three three. You know, that's that's fine, but nothing special. I would take Gingerbread Hunter over it for sure. We do have an interesting rare. I didn't get to play with this once, um, and that is the Apprentice's Folly. Um, this makes a copy of a non-token creature you control that doesn't have the name of another token you control or some such thing. Basically, Chapter 1 makes a copy of one of your creatures. Chapter 2, you have to make a copy of a different creature that doesn't already have a token copy of it in play. Um, and then chapter three gets rid of all of that stuff. So the way you want to play this um, is make copies of things with chapter one and two and then bargain it away before chapter three. That way you hold on to the tokens. Um, this was in a super synergistic blue-red deck I made, and I got to go off with it a couple times, and it still didn't feel that impressive. It was sort of sad. It had to do with the fact that the creatures I had in play weren't that good. Like, you know, if I'm making a copy of, you know, a catapult or something... Even with a bunch of spells around, it's not going to be that impressive. Um, but I think it has a lot of upside. It takes a ton of work, though. Like, you need, like, five cards with Bargain before it becomes really good. If you're a really aggressive blue-red deck, too, it can be good just because those token copies can help you win the game. It does add to the board. But I still don't love the fact that, like, the fail case is, well, I didn't kill my opponent, and I sort of spent four mana doing nothing as a result. So I would definitely take Gingerbread Hunter here. I think I'd still be tempted to take the Folly second. Um, I think it has a high enough ceiling and probably the Firebolt uh, after that. So that will do it for this edition of Neats and Notes. Next week, I'll have enough drafts under my belt where I can start saying, well, here are the things, the cards I know I was wrong about at this point in that video. People always seem to enjoy that video. So that will be coming uh, next week. Um, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to catch up on past videos, including my set review and draft videos for this new format, you should see some playlists on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching. <laughs>